Hello and welcome to this bonus lecture at the SPM, MEG and EEG course. Um, the, the topic of this talk is about a toolbox kind of built into SPM uh, but is kept separate from the core of it called DIAS, which is an alternative uh, source reconstruction toolbox. So in the course so far you've seen how we do source reconstruction in SPM and we've shown you that it's based on uh, building a generative model which assumes Bayes' formula and from that we get uh, a max a priori equation which explains how all the currents in the brain manifests as the MEG sensors or EEG sensors. It's a, it's a really powerful method and as you've seen in the talks and demonstration it's a very it's very good. However, uh, what SPM has done is they've tried to make it simple for you to use um, by taking away quite a lot of the control. So because you're using a generative model, you have to assume you know precisely where all the sources are occurring from. So in this case, SPM has assumed that you can only model sources which are in the cortex. Um, secondly, you have to assume that the whole cortex is active in some description, i.e. all of the data can be projected to the entirety of the brain. It may not be active at once, but uh, at some point you're expecting activity from that area. Uh, also, in terms of the flavour of source reconstruction, if you've ever read any of the wider literature on this, we're using Bayesian generative models, and they're the only option built into the core of SBM. And if you're a beginner at this, there's lots of hidden parameters, which you may read about in papers, which are hidden away from you, which is obviously very useful when you're starting out, but if you need to start becoming a power user, it's not so straightforward. So. We also have built into SPM as a separate toolbox, this thing called DIAS, which stands for Data Analysis in Source Space. Uh, it's incredibly flexible. Um, it's ability for you to basically chain lots of different analysis methods together is its real power. Some of the key features, which I'll go into a bit more detail, it will allow you to choose how you generate your source space. Don't have to assume that it's completely constrained by the cortex. Um, there's a whole gallery of uh, source inversion methods you can use from Bayesian methods to spatial filters and I'll go into that a bit more later uh, and rather than just generating a couple of prescribed methods of outputting your data there's lots more things you can analyze in source space with this toolbox and the good news is that a lot of this can be exported to SPM second level inference uh, tools so if you want to find a group effect you still can and typically the way that the data is ingested through this is that you take your pre-processed data, you import it, you pick your source space, you do your reconstruction, and then you decide if you want to build a statistical image, some description, or export a time series for further analysis. So in terms of the source methods, um, so obviously the, the classical uh, version of SPM's invert module uh, assumes that all the sources are on a cortical mesh, uh, normally for most people, the canonical cortical mesh, and all the sources are oriented normal to the cortical surface. Obviously there is merit to making those assumptions, but sometimes there will be reasons that you want to break that. For example, you might be looking for something in the hippocampus and the cortical mesh may not uh, satisfy the perfect source space for you. So one of the things you can do is uh, either take a cortical mesh and allow the dipoles to be oriented in any direction you want rather than just uh, normal to the surface or you can do a full volumetric uh, analysis something more akin to what you would do with MRI data which means that you make no assumption about where uh, the data is originated or you make fewer assumptions. In terms of inversion methods we've got loads uh, from some of the classic distributed source solutions such as minimum norm solutions and many of the variants which have come out through the 80s and 90s and the 21st century um, there's a couple of Bayesian distributed source solutions, so Champagne, which comes from uh, the Californian labs, uh, and the empirical Bayesian beamformer is also uh, in DIAS. Uh, it's a, a method which is also in the core version of SPM as well. And a couple of spatial filtering methods, uh, beamforming, which is a time domain spatial filter, and DICS, which is a frequency domain spatial filter, but effectively they do more or less the same thing. Um, these are pretty cool because you don't have to assume a whole generative model of the brain. If you wanted to, you could just pick one dipole and reconstruct that, and it won't project all of your MEG or EEG data into that one space.
which is kind of neat. And the demo will be using the Beamformer. In terms of summary methods, there's lots of things you could try. You could do phase amplitude coupling if that's your thing. A coherence between a reference signal or a reference source to do some kind of basic connectivity. Uh, you can measure power, which is probably one of the simplest measures you can do with this. Uh, there's some simple multivariate analyses you could try as well uh, to look for experimental contrasts, complex contrasts with this. And the list is endless. And also this entire system is completely flexible, so you can write your own custom code to do a custom analysis at the source level. Um, in terms of how we would control this thing, uh, there's about three different ways you can do this. So the simplest thing is to use the GUI or the batch. So if you go to SPM to the Tools tab, there's a, a box called Dias, and you can pick all the individual modules, and I'll show you how to use that. Alternatively, there's a set of like kind of pre-baked recipes. So if you click on the Dias tab on the main user interface panel, uh, there's lots of uh, different options to use either Eloretta or Minimum Norm or do some multivariate imaging. Um, and there's also one for LCMV imaging for Neuromag, which might be useful for the demo in a minute. If you don't like using the GUI, you can uh, script this. Uh, originally, all you could do was use batch code, which you may have seen some of already in the course, which is this kind of very long, very uh, unintuitive way of coding the data. Um, it's it's powerful, you can see every option, but it's obviously very hard to remember precisely what you're looking for. However, if you've got a very recent version of SPM, possibly one straight off GitHub, there's a, a set of functions called the Dice Wizard, where you can communicate it with using a simple uh, option structure, and then it will populate the batch for you automatically and even run the batch for you. Um, and this is like an example of what it looks like. So if we take, for example, the previous slide, all of this is to generate a covariance matrix, which is a lot of options, a lot of characters you have to type. The equivalent version is merely a few lines. It's much simpler. Okay, so let's let's do a, a demo example of how to uh, do some beamforming with the uh, data set we've been using throughout the course, this uh, Wakeman and Henson Phases and Houses data set. Um, if you want to follow along, you can scan the QR code. Alternatively, you can uh, follow this link here. So what we need to do is we need to beamform. And so for a given source, the way to some of the channels you want to find to source localize in a given area of the brain is you need to know the respective dipole lead field for that current source and current orientation. And you need the sensor covariance matrix, which is a data driven measure. Um, however, for the Megan data set we're using, uh, for the Wakeman and Henson data set, um, things are a little bit tricky in calculating the C variable, and I'll briefly explain why before we start doing the demo. Um, so typically, as you can see, we're using the inversion of the source covariance, which is fine if the number of useful eigenvalues and eigenvectors in your data set matches the number of channels you have. Um, but we've got two quirks of the Megan scanner. First, it has two different kinds of uh, sensors. So it's got magnetometers and it's got planar gradiometers. And if we just look at the individual eigenspectra, which is a very quick summary of effectively measuring the variance uh, across channels, uh, in this case, the magnetometers have a covariance which is about four orders of magnitude larger than the gradiometers. So one of these will dominate if we invert. Secondly, um, we've applied max filter to this because it's an elector data set and it's a part of their suite of denoising tools. And as you can see that after about 70 components per channel type, uh, the eigenvectors fall down. So, and these ones here are about 15 orders of magnitude smaller than the ones here. And all of these components down here is everything projected out by max filter. So if we were to just invert this matrix, these eigenvectors will dominate. So all we're doing is projecting noise back in and we're suppressing all of the real brain data. And we don't want to do that. So there's two things we're going to do here in this data set. First, we're going to whiten the data to make sure that the two sensor types have equal variance to each other. And secondly, to overcome the fact that MaxFilter has made this uh, covariance matrix rank deficient, we're going to truncate it before that drop off in eigenvectors later on, uh, before we make the invert of that covariance matrix. So let's do that. Okay, so I've got MATLAB open up, 
and um, I'm in a working directory which has got the data set for doing the source reconstruction already downloaded. So as you can see, we've got the mat and dat files which SPM likes. And there's a folder called SMRI which has got some structural information which will register to the data set later. So I'll launch SPM. And um, if you want to follow along, you, there's actually a recipe to help put in some of the default parameters. So if you click on the toolbox tab on the main UI, click DIAS, and in the drop down menu below, you can click on LCMV imaging for Neuromag. And that will generate a whole series of the, um, uh, the options for you. So for data reduction uh, and co-registering and so on. Um, but I'll go through these one by one. Okay, so if we start with the data reduction module, uh, first thing we need to do is import the data set we're interested in. So as you can see here, we've selected the original uh, data set which you did the source reconstruction on. Um, second, we need to specify a time window which we want to calculate the whitening transform over. Uh, by default, this is set to use the whole trial and all of the trials, but in this particular case, we just want to use the baseline, which is a, a fairly standard procedure for when you want to image um, evoked sources. So here we set the time window from inf negative infinity, uh, which will mean it with the earliest sample in the data set, up to zero, which is the, uh, the, the point when the stimulus is presented on the screen. Um, you need to select your channels, and we've selected channels by type, and we've selected both the MEG uh, magnetometers and the MEG plano gradiometers, which are the two sensor types with this MEG system. And then for the reduction method, we've obviously selected uh, whitening. We don't need to supply a noise data set because we're just going to use the baseline period of the trials. Um, the covariance inversion method you have to select, and we've picked tick on off because it's designed to work with rank deficient data, such as this data set. Uh, separate channel types. We want to set this to yes because we want to whiten each data set in uh, channel type individually, and this will make sure that their variances are scaled to be equal to each other. Uh, the lambdas we can set to zero. Uh, we can ignore this setting entirely. Kappa we want to set to 60 because as we showed you earlier the uh, the number of eigenvectors before it drops off is about 65 in this data set per sensor type so cutting at 60 is just a, a safe margin and you can leave the tolerance on zero. We don't want to keep the original channels in the data set um, because we're gonna we just want the whitened data and we don't want to keep any other extraneous channels, so this will get rid of the EEG uh, and some of the uh, auxiliary channels, which we don't need. And we can leave the prefix uh, at its default for R. So let's run that. And what you can see here as being generated is the eigenspectra, which I showed you earlier in the slides, of the two different sensor types before whitening. Um, and I'll show you what they look like after whitening later. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is kind of register the data set with the MRI. So we go to the MEG tab, click Source Reconstruction, and specify the head model. And with a bit of movie magic, I've already uh, filled in the details. So for the data set, we want to select the reduced data set, so it's this one beginning with R. I've left the inversion index set to the default of 1, because we've done no inversion on this reduced data set. Um, for the meshes tab, we want to select uh, an individual structural image, and from this we've picked the thing called mprage.nii in the SMRI folder. Mesh resolution, um, you can leave this at normal. We're not actually going to use this mesh at all. This is the mesh of the cortex. Uh, for co-registration, we've uh, manually specified where the coordinates are. So in the SMRI folder, you may have seen there is a text file called MRI FIDS. Um, and from here you can see in millimetres, this is where on the MRI, the Nasian, the left preauricular and the right preauricular um, landmarks are on the MRI. And in the data set, it knows where they are in the MEG and it will register them. So you type in the name of the fiducial label, which in this case is Nasian, LPA and RPA for the scanner. And then it wants you to type the MRI coordinates, which I've already done here. So you do this for all three. Uh, use head shape points. For this data set we have an additional digitized scalp from the EEG so we want to use that to refine our registration a bit more. 
Uh, for the forward models, we can use the defaults of the boundary element model for EEG, which we've thrown away anyway. And for the MEG, we'll just use the single shell. Uh, so we'll run that. So as you can see here, uh, once it's done the segmentation, the MRI, uh, and it's registered the data sets, you can see the uh, canonical cortex placed within the boundary of the subject's um, brain skull boundary. And what's very faint on the screen, you probably can't see this, are these individual dots, which represent the uh, different sensors. I'm not entirely sure why they've come up as dots and not as large coils. I think it's to do with the whitening. But if you can see them on your own screen, you can see that the data, the sensors are registered and the brain is within the uh, dome of the MEG sensors. Okay, now we've done that, we need to import this into the Dias toolbox itself. So we use the prepare data tab. Um, and what we need to do is select the directory we want to be working in. And this is where our working directory will be. So we'll leave this to our current folder for this, but you can pick wherever you like. Um, and then we need to select the MEG data set we're importing. And that is obviously our reduced data set. Um, I'm going to leave the inversion index to one because we're not too concerned about that. We'll get the sensor information from d.inv. We can leave that as is. So that's from the co-registration. It's going to take the sensor information from there. We'll leave the coordinate system to MNI aligned. This just means that when we want to specify locations later, we can give MNI coordinates and it automatically works out where in the subject's brain that is. Um, we want to overwrite any previous data which exists. So if click go on that. If you follow my cursor, you'll see in the folder, there's a thing called bf.mat around here on the left hand side. Uh, this now means that um, the data set has been imported and all of our working data will be stored in this structure going forwards. Okay, so if we move on to our next module, so if we go back into tools, dias, define sources, this is where we're now going to specify the, core, the uh, grid we're going to reconstruct all of our sources on, and we can specify the density of it. So first we need to pick our BF mat, which we've just generated, so we can click on that here. Um, reduce rank, we're going to leave as is. Basically, for this may have been mentioned in the course previously, but for if you pick uh, to generate dipolar field in three different directions, orthogonal to each other with MEG data, there's typically only two degrees of freedom rather than the full three. This is because for a approximately spherical source like the head, the radial component is typically orders of magnitude smaller than the tangential components. Um, so this accounts for that, which saves some hassle for you later. But don't worry about it. Just leave that to two and three and keep the original sensor orientation set to yes. What you should change is how we generate the source space. So we want to click on grid and then you're set with a few other options. The main one you're concerned with here is the resolution. So I'm going to leave it set to five, but if you want it to run a little bit quicker, you can reduce it to a different number such as 10, for example, but I'm going to leave it as five for here. And then you click go. And what will happen is first it will specify the source space, which is generated as these red dots within the entirety of the brain volume boundary. And here we are calculating the MEG lead fields in this progress bar. Now we're done. So I can delete that. So if I briefly bring up my slides, we've so far calculated for every point in space the L in this equation. So now we need to calculate C, the data covariance matrix. And that's what we're going to do next. So if we go to Tools, Dias, Covariance Features, we're now going to use this drop down menu and fill this in. I'm just going to populate this off camera and I'll come back to you and explain what's happened. Okay, so now I've filled it in, I'll explain what's happening here. So we've put our bf.mat file at the top here. Then it asks us what conditions we want to use to generate our covariance matrix. And we want to use all trials across all conditions. The more temporal data you can have, the better um, estimated your covariance matrix will be, and the better your source reconstruction will be. Likewise, we're going to use all the temporal information, we're going to use the whole trial um, rather than just a small window of it. Now we need to select our modalities, and for this MEG scanner we want to use both the MEG magnetometers and the planar gradiometers. Um, and in terms of fusing these, we're going to, um, rather than have two individual covariance matrices calculated, we're going to create one big one, which will just make computation a bit easier for us later. 
Uh, the zero cross terms is the best of an odd option, but we want to click MEG, MEG planar, and EEG. And what this will do, and I can show you graphically, if I bring over my slides again, is we're going to create one big covariance matrix which will look like this. So all the magnetometer covariances are calculated in this block here. This block down here is the gradiometer to gradiometer covariance, and all of the kind of interactions between them, the magnetometer gradiometers down here, we're just going to set to zero. We're not going to bother with those for now. Uh, to compute to uh, compute the covariance, we're going to do a band limited covariance. So within SPM, it will automatically filter each trial, uh, window them, and calculate the covariance and add them together at the end to get a trial average covariance. Uh, the frequency bands of interest, because it's an evoked response and it's a short trial, um, just to get the accuracy up, I've used as wide a bandwidth as possible, which in this case is from 0 to 100 hertz in this data set. And for regularization, we're going to do something very similar to what we did uh, earlier. We're going to truncate at 60 degrees of freedom. So if I specify that to 60, and I'll show you what happens next graphically. Uh, we don't need to bootstrap, and we're just going to visualize this. So we run that, it's now calculated the covariance, and what we can see here is that the uh, this is the eigenspectrum of the entire matrix fused together. So we've got 60 components from the magnetometers and the gradiometers. So in theory I could have set that to 120, but it's always better to be safe and sorry, so I've set it to 60, which means there will be some a little bit of small brain information thrown away, but it means that none of the noise which is here projected out by max filter at the bottom can creep back in. Okay, so now that we've uh, calculated the covariance of the lead fields, we combine them to actually do the beam forming itself. This is to give us the uh, reconstruction weights, the W in that equation. So we specify our beam former, and then from my inverse methods, we're gonna pick LCMV. Uh, we're going to leave orient to maximum power as yes, because for this we only want one measure per source. Uh, we're going to use the three triplet lead fields and we're going to take a linear combination of them to maximize power in that area. And we don't need to keep the oriented lead fields afterwards. And then all we need to do is click play and then it will very quickly combine these and our beam form weights have been generated. So now that we've specified our beam former, weights we can now work out how we're going to output the data and to do that there's two things we can do okay so now we want to generate our power images um, showing us how much power there is in a certain time frequency window uh, to go into our second level analysis so we've picked our bf.mat file um, and now we want to specify that we want to output a power image so we click on this um, and I've already filled these labels in, but we've generated three condition labels, one for famous faces, one from familiar faces, and one for scrambled. Uh, we can leave the setting set to no because we're not bootstrapping, so it's not important for us. Uh, in the SPM manual, the example for the group analysis shows a time frequency window of 150 to 250 milliseconds, which should pick up the M170 when you detect a face, for example. Uh, and we're doing this in the 10 to 20 hertz band. Uh, the time contrast is just set to 1 because we're generating a single image per trial and we're not doing a baseline correction of any description, not yet anyway. Uh, we want to take the log of power because what this will do is two things for us. Uh, first, it will make the data more Gaussian, which is good for a second level analysis. And secondly, it will minimize the uh, change in variance in the center of the brain where beamformers tend to bias a lot of their variants incorrectly, so it's just mainly noise, but very loud noise in the center of the brain. So very quiet, but high SNR cortical signals. By log transforming that, the ratio between the center of the brain and the edge of the brain is diminished quite a lot, which makes it a lot easier for us to cope with. We want one image per condition, so what it should generate is three images um, per, uh, an image per condition, so three per subject. We want to leave unit noise gain to zero because this is a data driven depth correction method. Um, but this is varies from subject to subject. So it's very hard to model this in a second level analysis. Um, this can be ignored because this is related to this option. And finally, we leave the modality to MEG. And then we've passed it onto the right module, which is in the DIAS toolbox folder. 
we want to write out a nifty because it's a volumetric image we're trying to generate uh, no global normalization and keep the image space to MNI. So that means that we've already registered them to MNI space for a second level analysis. And then we can run that. So hopefully what we can see from the progress bar is it's generating three images there. And then the next step is going to write them out. And if we have a look in our current folder, you'll see three nifty files been generated. One with each of the three conditions. And we're done. And that's one subject's images generated. So in theory, you can leap, loop through all of your subjects and then pass them onto SPM to do with second level analysis. Um, but one thing I'd like to do just to demonstrate if there's any effect in this one subject is I'm going to do the contrast by hand with this bit of code here. And what we're going to do is we're going to add the two famous faces, uh, the, the two face conditions, uh, and we're going to subtract the scrambled condition. And then there's a factor of two here to balance out the fact it's two trial types versus one. And then we'll visualize what that looks like. And as you can see, the largest cluster is down here. It looks like it's in the cerebellum, but this is just a slight uh, registration issue. But basically what we've picked up here is the M170 effect in the face fusiform area, where there's more power when you detect a face versus just a scrambled image. Now, not only can you do images, we can also export time series data. So I'm going to show you how to do that uh, with this. So for example, if we wanted to have a look at what's going on in that right face fusiform area. So what we've done here is we want to create something called a montage. Um, because what this will do is take a weighted sum of a whole load of sources. It extracts for a given location, one um, virtual electrode. Um, so what I've done is I specified what I want the thing I've called the right facial uh, facial fusiform area. Um, this is the MNI coordinates for the kind of the canonical FFA uh, in the right hemisphere. And what I want to do is take all sources within a 10 millimeter radius and then perform uh, a PCA on them to get maximum SNR for my time series. And then what I'm going to do is write them out as an SPM data set for analysis to do your time frequency analysis later so it's going to create a data set so if we click on that we'll see if anything appears in the progress bar there we go it's applied the montage and as you can see here highlight it here we've got our new SPM data set um, so just to have a look to see if we can see anything I'm going to import that data set I'm now going to segment the trials into the three categories and look at the trial average response to see if we can see anything in a face fusiform area. Um, and as you can see, what we see is we get the stronger evoked response at about 170 milliseconds. In this case, it thinks it's about 150 in this data set for famous faces and unfamiliar faces compared to uh, scrambled images of faces and we seem to get this large DC offset um, for faces in this area compared to scrambled uh, which is what is actually seen in the original Wakeman and Henson paper they show a very similar evoke response for the three conditions uh, and with that that's a, a brief tour into what you can do with Dias uh, on the data set you've been playing with so far this week and I'm happy to take any more questions you may have